Phil. Um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we get started, I want to say it's a great pleasure and an honor to speak to this large and diverse audience with 144 and counting um, in the in the in the meeting. So even though it's only virtual, because I think it's really showing the success that we have had with the UFS already. I will be talking about a core component of the UFS, the Common Community Physics Package (TCPP), and I would like to begin by mentioning my many collaborators on this project. The most important ones are listed here on the slide, but many more people, internal and external to NOAA, are part of this effort. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I I don't see your slide. Bill, you can see my slides. I see the. Um, I can yeah. see them. I can, I can see, see the. Them. Um, the drive. You, you only you sorry Tyler, you so you only see his Google Drive side. So that's so what I see now is the Google Drive and then now I'm seeing his presentation. Okay, slide number two. I try again. All right, so one of the cornerstones of the UFS is to facilitate the improvement of physical parameterizations and their transition from research to operations by enabling the community to participate in the development and testing. So that's quite a mouthful, but that's where the CCPP comes in. The CCPP consists of three GitHub repositories. They're open source, um, public, and accepting external contributions. We have the CCPP framework. This is the actual infrastructure component that connects a set of CCPP compliance physics schemes in the CCPP physics repository to an atmospheric model. And we have an extensive documentation package in CCPP doc. The CCPP is designed as a model agnostic tool to enable collaborations and accel accelerate transition of innovations, um, for example, by lowering the bar to add new schemes or transfer them between models. The CCPP is also an essential part of the hierarchical system development framework of the unified forecast system. And as such, CCPP is implemented in the single column model as shown in the bottom right here. So that means that you can run exactly the same physics high up in that funnel where the understanding of processes is important, but also in fully coupled complex modeling systems. Now, the CCPP relies on documented interfaces, which we also call metadata. And there are two types of metadata. There are metadata tables on the physics side, and each of those physics schemes has its own metadata. And these describe the variables that are required to run a certain physics scheme. There are metadata, on, metadata tables on the host model side that describe the variables that a host model is providing. The CCPP framework analyzes these metadata tables at compile time and then matches variables by a property called standard name in order to auto-generate um, a whole pool of physics suite caps that connect the physics to the model. So it's important um, to note that in this frame, in this system, the CCPP framework and the order generated caps replace traditional physics drivers. There is no physics driver file anymore. And I will be talking about physics suites a lot. So it's also important to note that the physics suite construct, so that vetted combination of schemes is important. But at the same time, the CCPP must enable an easy interchange of schemes within a suite. So you can interpret this as the dual purposes of the CCPP, the operational side on the one hand where the suites dominate and then the research side where configurability is more important. So obviously those suite definitions files are important and CCPP uses them at build time. And I'm going to show you one in its full glory right now. And boom, this is the um, candidate for operational implementation FV3 GFS version 16 beta suite with everything that comes with it. The first thing to note is that there are many more schemes than most of you might have expected, thinking about shallow convection, deep convection, microphysics, and so on. And the reason is, coming back to what I just said, that um, in the CCPP, there is no physics driver anymore. And as many of you might know, physics driver files contain an awful lot of glue code that glue together different parameterizations, and they can often have 10, 20,000 lines of code. So all this code needs to be broken up into schemes, which we call interstitial schemes. And we'll come back to this in a minute. But to take a look at that group construct, a suite definition file can consist of one or multiple groups. Those can be called individually in order to do other computations in between or in one go as they're listed in the XML file. We are supporting a subcycling construct that allows you to call schemes at higher frequency or with a smaller time step or to support that surface iteration loop um, in the GFS surface physics. The ordering of the schemes in a suite definition file is entirely up to the user. As you can see here from this little blow up, um, 
precaution needs to be taken when something like this is done. So for example, here you see that's the radiation group, you see the RRTMG shortwave and longwave schemes, that's the actual physics and a bunch of pre and post schemes. So if a user wanted to run um, the longwave before the shortwave and no such, such suite exists um, that ex exercises this behavior already, then that user is well advised to look into these pre and post schemes to make sure that the connection is good and still working as intended. Uh, Phil, just checking in. Can you still hear me? Yes. Good, because I'm a branded child. I was thrown out of a meeting and kept presenting just for myself. No. So, okay, <laughs> here we go. So um, the, that metadata that I mentioned before serves two purposes. One is um, it's used to auto-generate the caps, as I explained, but it's also used to generate complete scientific documentation together with inline doxygen markups in the code. And here is an example from the um, last release of the CCPP version 4 for the GFDL cloud microphysics scheme. Coming back to, do the, to the dual purpose of serving operations and the research community, the CCPP provides options for performance and flexibility, and I'm going to give you an example or two examples here. So in order to maintain the required performance for operations, CCPP uses a multi-suite static build. That means when you compile the UFS or also the CCPP single column model, you specify a number of suites on the command line. So what CCPP does is it parses all available physics schemes that are you know, in the subdirectories and so, and then filters unused schemes and variables in order to generate auto generate Fortran caps specific for each of these suites. So these caps are highly efficient. There is no branching in there. There is no if Thompson then do this, otherwise if GFDL microphysics do this. It calls a shallow convection scheme, a deep convection scheme, a PBL scheme, an interstitial scheme, a microphysics scheme, done. On the other hand, um, to support the flexibility that users want to have, um, we have implemented automatic unit conversions to expedite development and transitions. So here's a real world example. FE3 specifies cloud effective radio in micrometer. Thompson microphysics wants them in meter. And the CCPP framework knows about the difference at compile time from the metadata tables. So when it comes to writing those physics caps, the framework injects the appropriate code to scale these areas before entering Thomson Microphysics and then scales it back um, when returning from Thomson Microphysics. Recently, we also added a new attribute called active to um, the metadata, which tells the CCPP um, whether an area should be allocated or not, depending on some runtime flags. So the good thing about this is it allows the CCPP to skip any operations on these data if they're not required or not even allocated and to avoid false alarms when turning on debug flags, such as out of boundaries. <clears throat> All right, so where do we stand with the CCPP? The CCPP is part of the authoritative UFS code repository. It has been merged into the UFS weather model in July, 2019. And for an extended transition to period of about a year, so coming to an end right now, we kept the CCPP physics bit for bit identical with the existing IPD physics to facilitate that transition on the NOAA end. It's also included in the UFS medium range and short range weather, subseasonal to seasonal and hurricane apps, um, and all this happened in 2020. Further, the CCPP is scheduled for operational implementation in the global forecast system and the global ensemble forecast system in the 2023 to 2024 timeframe. So <clears throat> thus far we had four releases of the CCPP, each of them with updates to the physics and additional physics and also updates to the host models that are supported. Um, version 5 is on the horizon. It's expected for November this year as part of the UFS short range with the application public release. So returning to the concept of suites, with CCPP version 4, we were supporting four suites to the community, two of them only with the single column model, the other two with both single column model and UFS medium range weather app. So that's the operational GFS version 15.2 suite, then the GFS version 16 beta candidate for next implementation cycle, and then two experimental suites, one from the climate process team and one containing mostly rapid hurt physics. Worth noting, and um, Jacob mentioned that beforehand, that with the short range weather app release, we will be supporting a RRFS version one beta suite that basically is a derivative of the rapid hurt physics um, suite. Besides those physics in those suites, we have many more parameterizations in the CCPP physics master repository. They're all listed here, and you can see from the color coding who contributed it. And obviously, the DTC did the bulk of the work when we initially stood up the CCPP. 
But since then, several organizations in NOAA, but also outside, like Oklahoma University, have contributed physics, and we are seeing more and more of this as we speak. So that's very exciting. Another exciting and important event for the CCPV was the signing of the NOAA NCA Memorandum of Agreement in early 2019. So in this MOA, both organizations agreed to jointly develop the CCPP framework as a single system to communicate between models and physics. Hey, Dan, you have three um, minutes. Yep. As part of this, <clears throat> sorry, as part of this um, MOA, um, as part of this MOA, NCA will be making contributions to the CCPV framework, for example, an augmented metadata standard, that's something we already adopted in the UFS, automatic variable allocations for variables used by physics, and so on. Now, important is that, an important point here is that because the CCPP um, auto-generates so much code on the fly, it provides ample opportunities for future development. For example, we can implement automatic array transformations from IKJ to IK to KI, whatever it is, similar to what I've showed you, shown you beforehand for the unit conversions. Uh, along the same line, we can calculate derived variables, say a scheme wants potential temperature, but we only have temperature and geopotential from the host model. Um, because the CCPP has a complete knowledge of the data flow at compile time, we can think about visualization tools that help developers, such as a flow graph for air temperature, where you see, okay, that variable isn't used in a parameterization, it's an intent in another, it gets updated somewhere else. And we can also flag logical flaws, such as, um, okay, in the tweet that you came up with, a variable is read in the beginning and it's never written to beforehand. Um, other goodies are automated saving of physics games, scheme states for restarts and extended diagnostic output capabilities from schemes. Two important ones are listed down here. The first one is the ability to create CCPP or new UPSI caps for physics and then have the user choose to run them either inline or a separate component. And that's actually something required for the UFS. You've seen that little picture on the right as part of Ricky Root's slides in the beginning today. And lastly, um, the ability to generate optimized caps to dispatch physics on CPUs, GPUs. So something that is obviously required for next generation HPCs. So to summarize, the interoperability of the CCPP enables the transition of innovations from research to operations and back, and thus supports the goals of the unified forecast system. So that's where I'm going to stop. I thank you for your attention, and then I'm looking forward to your questions and comments in Slack. Anybody out there? Uh, yeah, so um, I'm not seeing any questions coming in on Slack. Um, I do see that Rocky um, Dunlap maybe has a question, um, and it, it says to take take us to the questions pane, but I cannot find the questions pane at this time. So Rocky, um, maybe put it into Slack if you have a question. And it looks like Fanglin um, Yang just asked, the question, will CCPP provide both single and double precision versions? At this point, not yet. We have followed the GFS implementation, which was double precision. Um, it's certainly doable if this is something that is required. No other questions. Okay, um, so Rocky, I have the slides up. Can everybody see my, um, well, Rocky's slide? You see the title slide? Yes. Okay, so Rocky, are you there? So I'm, I'm gonna click refresh. It might take 15 seconds to see if I can see it. Okay, I, okay. so I can hear you now.
Rocky, you there? I seem to have lost Rocky. Give him a minute. Rocky, are you there? Rocky, are you there? Hmm. Keeps on going back to mute. Hi, Phil. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. All right. I'm not sure what was going on. Thanks for sharing the slides. OK, all right. OK, uh, my name is Rocky Dunlap. I'm the uh, core team manager of the Earth System Modeling Framework and co-chair of the UFS System Architecture and Infrastructure Cross-Cutting Team. And my talk today is on the coupling infrastructure that's used within the UFS. And I want to also recognize that the ESMF core team members, which is a distributed team of developers across multiple um, agencies, are also uh, listed as co-authors on this uh, presentation for their work with, with ESMF. Next slide. So the outline for the talk, um, I want to start with a big picture of the UFS uh, shared system architecture and then get into the specific role of the Earth System Modeling Framework and the Nuazi layer uh, within the UFS. That includes aspects like the unified driver, um, the coupling interfaces to model components, uh, handling of communication and regridding, handling coupled systems with three, four, or five components, asynchronous I.O., and then options for systematic testing. Uh, and then on the last part, we'll look at uh, downloading ESMF user support and training. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is a picture of the unified, um, the UFS unified system architecture. And what is significant about this is the fact that there is a single architecture that has been defined uh, that applies to all seven of the UFS applications. Uh, and, and this is a huge um, advantage because it means that we are not attempting to maintain um, separate architectures, separate implementations, um, different technical choices for how to connect all these pieces together. Uh, we are um, bringing um, all of these applications together into a, into a common architecture. Next slide. So zooming in on one part of that architecture and one place where we are reaping the benefits of having to find um, a common way um, of, of working is in the forecast model itself. So zo zooming in on that, you see um, that the um, that ESMF and Nuopsy are a central part of the architecture. So you see a, a unified driver layer there. You see the atmosphere model that has a cap, what's called a new OPSI cap on top of it. Um, you see other components in there, the ocean, ice, wave um, components and their caps as well, and then a set of mediators. And all of that is using beneath it an infrastructure called uh, ESMF new OPSI. Um, ESMF and new OPSI uh, provide the model interfaces and help to integrate all of the components into a unified Earth system model. Um, ESMF and Nuopsy also ensure a high degree of architectural consistency across the seven applications. Um, so this helps to elim eliminate duplication of effort across the application teams. It helps developers and users in the community also more easily move between applications because they're seeing a common uh, common architecture, common way of building the coupled system and the different coupled configurations, uh, significant code reuse, and then consistency across the UFS applications of, as they are released. Next slide. So um, ESMF stands for the Earth System Modeling Framework. Uh, it is a community developed and community governed software package for building uh, numerical weather prediction, climate, and other um, Earth system modeling applications. So you can think of ESMF as a toolkit or general 
uh, general framework for building coupled systems out of sets of model components. And part of ESMF uh, includes uh, high performance capabilities for connecting models such as uh, grid remapping and parallel communication. On top of ESMF is another layer called NUOPSI. It's the National Unified Operational Prediction Capability. Um, and the purpose of the NUOPSI layer is to standardize the coupling protocol um, and build on top of ESMF a set of four generic components that simplify building coupled systems. And uh, the UFS is leveraging this as part of their architecture. So we'll talk about the driver connector model and mediator components. Next slide, please. I want to mention that ESMF and NUOPSI are part of a multi-agency organization. So in addition to UFS, um, the U.S. Navy and their regional and global systems are using ESMF NUOPSI infrastructure. NASA models, GEOS and Model E, and also the NCAR climate model, CESM. Um, having um, in a, an infrastructure level that's multi-agency is an advantage for UFS um, because um, anytime you're dealing with infrastructure software, the more applications you have using the software, it gives a lot of advantages, such as increasing the, the robustness of the software through a lot of, of, of different users. Um, capabilities developed in one system can be brought over into other systems, and it also improves interoperability of components. And this is facilitating bringing in new model components into the UFS. Next slide, please. Within the UFS, um, I'm, I'm going to be showing, I guess I just want to say, I'm going to be showing some different diagrams of different configurations of UFS applications as we go through these slides. Um, the unified driver is a single driver that is used across all of the UFS applications. This is an advantage because each application team does not have to duplicate the driver code and come up with their own solution for this. Um, this driver supports a user-friendly text file that describes the uh, run sequence of the, the components that are participating in a given configuration. I'll show you example, an example of one of those run sequences. The model components are optionally included or excluded during initialization of the application. That means you can easily turn on and off uh, the different components that are underneath this unified driver for different configurations. And the driver can be easily extended with new components and also supports multiple models of the same type. An example of this is for the ocean component. There are currently two different ocean models supported under the unified driver. That's uh, MOM6 used in the S to S application and HICOM, which is being used in the hurricane application. Next slide, please. This is an example of the run sequence syntax. This syntax here replaces what would otherwise be um, hundreds of lines of Fortran code. And this is a, a capability within Nuopsy to ingest this plain text file and interpret it, and then to be able to sequence uh, a, a coupled system uh, based on the requirements that, that are in place for that for that system. So you can see here, there's multiple levels of nesting with an outer loop running at an 1800 second coupling interval and an inner loop running at a 600 second interval. Um, you see the atmosphere, ice, and ocean components and when they're executing and, you, and the MED stands for mediator um, and that's the coupler component that's sitting in the middle. So each of the UFS applications has one or more of these run sequences, but they all share this common syntax. Next slide. Another advantage of the unified driver approach is options for connection to the data assimilation system. Um, the, the UFS uh, driver provides a full range of access to the coupled model state. So this kind of architecture here um, simplifies how the DA system can control the forecast model and also simplifies access, particularly in cases where it's desirable to do in-core DA 
to be able to access um, the state of individual components and the full coupled state, which will be um, important as uh, weakly coupled and strongly coupled DA uh, applications are developed within the UFS. Next slide. ESMF and Nuopsy are providing unified model interfaces to all of the models that are included in UFS applications. These are what have been referred to as Nuopsy caps. They are a non-intrusive layer. Um, it's a small translation layer, typically one or two files that sits on top of a model component. Um, they, they specify the provided and required coupling fields that are going into and, and coming out of each of those components. Um, it supports 1D, 2D, and 3D coupling fields, a variety of structured grids and meshes, and global and regional uh, model grids. And you can map between global and regional grids. Um, it adapts to the native memory layouts within the components, so you don't have to uh, reshuffle your data or have extraneous copies. Um, and the Nuopsy caps, these interface layers, live in each of the components' authoritative repository, which means um, there's only one cap per component, and they are reused across the different applications. Next slide. Yes, just say uh, three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, optimized intermodal communication. The green arrows are called connectors, and the advantage of these connectors um, are that at runtime, they negotiate the most optimized connection that's possible. Um, so when you see these connectors, we often have questions about, is there a large performance overhead? And the answer is there, there does not have to be, because if you have your model set up and your memory laid out uh, in a consistent way between components, you can actually share memory between the components. So the connectors become uh, very, very fast operations. They can also regrid if needed between model grids. Next slide, please. When you're dealing with um, multiple models within a coupled application, the complexity can quickly grow. And so within Nuopsy, we provide a special component called the mediator, which is specifically designed to couple to multiple other components. Um, each component announces which fields they provide and they need, and the mediator uh, connects all the components and provides the regridding and remapping capability, all of that fully in parallel. Next slide, please. Just some more detail on the ESMF regridding capabilities that UFS is able to leverage. Um, as I said, all everything is in, in parallel. So uh, the com computation of the interpolation weights uh, is done in 3D space fully in parallel. There's never a point where uh, things are sent to a single processor. Um, you can access this capability through Fortran, Python, or through the command line. So it's a very powerful, flexible capability for grid remapping. Next slide, please. Also within the UFS, um, ESMF and Nuopsy is providing an asynchronous I.O. capability. This is called the right component within the UFS atmosphere. Essentially, the atmosphere is divided into forecast tasks and write tasks, and, and we treat asynchronous I.O. as a coupling problem and leverage all of the ESMF regridding um, and parallel communication capabilities in order to send data from the atmosphere over to the right component and write that out in parallel while the atmosphere forecast is happening. And then the plot to the right is showing some uh, recent optimization efforts that improved the send times by 85%. And this is being uh, deployed in GFS v16. Next slide. Um, incremental building and testing of coupled configurations is very important. Um, and this gives you a, a capability to replace an active component. In this case, um, this is a configuration of the UFS Hurricane um, application where the active atmosphere has been replaced with a data component that's reading forcings from file and sending those to the mediator. Because of the way that the CAP interfaces work, there's no need to make any changes to the mediator or the ocean component in this case, the exact same interfaces um, are used, but this system is easier to debug and runs faster because there's not an active um, atmosphere. So it's uh, very good for testing and development phases. Next, um, next slide, please. As far as um, getting help and getting the code, 
If you download the UFS medium range application release, ESMF is one of the external libraries that's included, so it's built automatically with NCEPLIB's externals. You can also get the code and build it separately from GitHub. Uh, questions, bug fixes, feature requests, any problems you're having, uh, please send a message to ESMF underscore support at ucar.edu. And we try to be very responsive to that. So your questions are welcome. And then finally, at the bottom, the training options are uh, available on that website, as well as some previous um, materials from previous training events. Next slide. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tara, your questions? Yeah, it looks like there's a question here from Ben Cash. Um, in the diagram of the common infrastructure, we know that at least in the workflow box, there can be a lot of variation. Are there similar variances between applications in the other components, or is workflow unique in that? That's a really good question. Speaking from the perspective of the coupling infrastructure, there has been a concerted effort to make sure that that is um, done in a unified way across the applications. And that took some time. I think with respect to workflow, maybe that process is just getting started. So there is more uh, diversity of implementations within the workflow. But I think what's important is that we're heading towards a unified architecture with respect to all of the different infrastructure pieces. All right. Um, thank you. We're going to move on to um, Lindsay Blank's talk. Uh, whenever you're ready, Lindsay. Hi. Can you see my full screen presentation, or do you still see just no, like I, I see, I see the well, yeah, you can see the sidebar and all that with the. Oh, you can. Yeah, um, yeah. Let me try. Oh, why isn't it working? Hold on. Let me let me do this again. Give me one second, I apologize. Um, let me go here. Microsoft. Okay, now can you just see? The now, slide? now it looks good, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much and thank you all for uh, being patient with me while I figured all that out. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Lindsay Blank and I will be presenting on extending the feature-based methods to identify systematic errors in tropical and extratropical cyclone diagnostic fields. I would like to, uh, before I begin, um, thank my co-authors and also acknowledge that funding for this project came from NWS OSTI. So the motivation of this project has to do with errors in uh, track bias and tropical cyclone forecasting. So here's an example here, the ECMWF ensemble and GEFs along track errors, ATEs, and the cross track errors for extratropical versus non-extratropical cases. And this is over a period from 2008 to 2017 from Leonardo et al. And as you'll see, if you look, uh, the ECMWF's mean ATEs for extratropical cases are significantly larger than those of the GEFs. And the mean cross-track errors are generally much smaller than the um, along track errors for both ensembles. And the GEFs had a slight right of track bias for non-extratropical cases by about hours 96 to 120. And here what we're looking at is the right of track GEFs bias uh, for days greater than day three. So it's the best track centered um, four right minus four left, most members. Uh, standardized differences, so 700 millibar height is shaded, and eight, uh, those differences, and 850 to 200 millibar steering flow errors. Um, so what we're seeing here with this track bias is that there is some relation to uh, tropical, subtropical ridge decay, but the question is why? How can we investigate these errors? And the answer to that comes to taking a look at diagnostic tools. So the goal of this project is to develop diagnostics for MET Plus that help UFS developers and other users to diagnose systematic biases and improve models. Uh, focus on this project is medium range cyclone errors. Um, adding capability to the existing feature relative capability of MET 
and MetPlus to compute derived fields using Python from multiple model fields, such as moisture budgets, and pass those diagnostic fields in to be used by the Met tools. Uh, another goal is to augment MetPlus plotting scripts, uh, also known as MetPlotPy, to visualize errors, and finally develop use case examples and comment training for uh, the diagnostics. So first I'm going to talk about MetPlus and kind of the feature relative use case updates. So what is MetPlus? Uh, MetPlus is an entire software system that has Python wrappers wrapped around the Met tools, uh, the, the core Met database and display systems. Um, there's plotting, including Met Viewer and Met Express user interfaces, as well as a Met Viewer batch engine and uh, Python plotting scripts like the MetPlotPy. There's communication between Met and Python algorithms and as well extensions to other verification packages. So here is the current version of MET, MET version 9.0, and these are all the tools that can be used and are in MET 9.0. And the ones highlighted in purple are the tools that will be used during this use case. So we've got regrid data plane, series analysis, and then the TC pairs and TC stat tool. So I wanna take a moment to go through this uh, flow chart and kind of go over what's going on here. So this is how the use case is set up. And, and how it flows. So first we have a vortex tracker to identify the feature of interest. Um, in this case, you, you can also use pre-existing tracks that exist, like those from the ATCF, which I'll be doing in this uh, use case. So once you have your track data, you then pass that, that and that track data must include uh, latitude, longitude, coordinates for the center of your feature of interest. And then that is passed to the TC pairs tool, which generates matched tropical cyclone data. And then that's passed to the TC stat tool, so we're still down here, uh, which filters the track data from TC pairs. And in the case I'm going to show, it's filtered by initialization time. Then we have, the, this is the new part, we have these Python scripts that can be called by MET to derive fluxes. So uh, the, the tool itself is called Pi Embed Ingest, and it runs the user-provided diagnostic Python scripts that generates fields and it generates fields for the forecast and for the observation, which is put into a NetCDF file that MET can read. And then we have, we're going back up here to extract tiles, which can take forecast analysis grids, both from a model or from your Python script. And it takes kind of a snapshot that narrows in on the feature of interest based on those uh, latitude, longitude coordinates that were provided earlier. So we kind of zoom in uh, in a tile over the feature of interest. And then what happens is that the output of the Python script gets narrowed in uh, into the, the area of the tile that is defined by extract tiles. So once we have our fields zoomed in on the feature of interest by extract tiles, we have these gridded tiles as an output at which we pass through into series analysis, which requests the calcul uh, which calculates the requested statistics um, by lead time in this case and then it outputs a gridded stats field, and at which point there is plotting that can be done, uh, including metplotpy or the um, kind of in the default plot data plane. So I know that was a lot, but we're gonna go through it. So this use case is, uh, the feature of interest is Hurricane Dorian. The forecast is the GFS grid for forecast. Observation is the grid for analysis. This series is going to be done over four initialization times, so August 30th, 2019 at 0, 6, 12, and 18 UTC. I'll be looking at five lead times, 90, 96, 102, 108, and 114. The diagnostics that were used to run statistics or calculate statistics are integrated vapor transport, IVT, and uh, potential vorticity. Most of this will be on IVT. The forecast track data is from the ATCF ADEC track. Uh, specifically the GFSO, um, and the observation track data is from the ATCF BDEC, or BEST track. So here what we're looking at is the output of uh, the Pi Embed Ingest tool of the IVT. And this is the MET tool used to produce this image is plot data plane. And this is for a, qu a quick look at your data, just to make sure things are oriented correctly, that look like a gut check, um, which is why we don't see any units here, but we'll get to that. And this was created, uh, and this, this is plotted from a NetCDF file that was created through the Pi Embed ingest. And it facilitates calling that Python script um, 
in a way that it can be used by the MET tools. So this script, which was provided by Taylor Mandelbaum, uh, computes IVT from v, the V component, U component, temperature, geopotential height, and specific humidity. So the nice thing about having these uh, capacity for these Python scripts is you can calculate kind of complex um, diagnostics or metrics based on multiple fields. And the red square is the, the feature over the feature of interest, which is Dorian. So now if you remember those tiles I was talking about, this is a 30 degree by 30 degree tile that is centered on Dorian. That centering information was provided by the track data. And this is again a plot data plane output, but you can see how we've narrowed in on this tile. And um, we and this is IVT right here. So this is for 2019 or September 3rd, 2019 at 12Z, but just an example of what extract tiles looks like. Now here's the example of what you can do with matplotpy. So this is showing the, so for this use case, I calculated uh, mean observation value, mean forecast value, so O bar and F bar, and then the mean error, which is defined as F bar minus O bar for IVT. Uh, this is in units of kilograms per meter per second. On the left is a still image that I'm going to just explain what you're seeing that is being looped through on the right. So this is the series by lean mean error, and this is for forecast hour 90, and the number, uh, this is the variable name, IVT, and the level is integrated to this, um, over all the lots of layers in the atmosphere. The number of initializations that I mentioned before is four. So what you're looking at here for each grid point is the mean um, error across those four initialization times for all of their out forecast hour 90 products. And on the right is a loop through those five hours I mentioned before, 90, 96, 102, 108, 114. Um, there is a lot that you can do here, including overlaying uh, sea level pressure um, contours, but this is just kind of like the final output that you can use with, with Python plotting and that you can investigate what's going on um, in your model with, with this mean air statistic. And I want to touch on quickly also potential vorticity, which we were able to, uh, again, use a diagnostic script provided by Taylor Mandelbaum. And this is, again, plot data plane. The units are in uh, PV units. Um, and this PV is calculated from absolute vorticity and the potential temperature fields. And then just a quick look at the um, mean observation value at forecast hour 90 for all of those initializations. Again, we're zoomed in on Dorian and here is the scale in uh, PVUs. So also I'd mentioned Comet. So the uh, Comet program through MetEd is going to be providing community UFS community support. There are online training modules being developed, which, which go over how to use and evaluate results from these new tools. Uh, a draft of the module script is being developed, which includes examples of data input and output results. And the completed module provides scientific content, use case examples, including the one that I've presented here, and learning outcome feedback. Yeah, so in summary, minutes. okay, right. perfect timing. In summary, MetPlus supports feature relative statistical analysis using user provided diagnostics. It also provides useful feature relative information for model developers. And for our future work, NCAR, uh, along with input from, the, from Stony Brook University, will enhance that MetPlotPy, MetPlus plotting algorithm, support the GFDL tracker in the use case itself. Uh, Stony Brook University will use tools to evaluate FB3-based prediction. And the DTC plans to release all use cases during the next MetPlus coordinated release, which is in March of 2021. I'd like to acknowledge our funding was provided by the NWS OSTI. Uh, special thanks to George McCabe and Minna Wynn for their software engineering assistance. Here is the links for the MET help desk, which you can email with questions about MET, MET plus GitHub, where you can download MET plus, uh, the Stony Brook University, you can find out more information there. Uh, this is my email if you have any questions. And I'm going to leave it at the, um, the NWS OSTI uh, slide with the accomplishments and deliverables. So with that, I will take any questions. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, Tara, are there any questions on the chat? There are no questions on the Slack channel. Okay, um, I'd like, um, like to thank our presenters for this session. Um, and in the spirit of time, I'd like to hand this over to Lisa to continue with the next session. Lisa, are you there?
Yes. Uh, so welcome everybody. This uh, coming session is the model dynamics, physics, and air quality. Uh, Tracy Hertnecki will be the moderator, and myself, Ligia Bernarde, will be here. Tracy, you can please go ahead and pass the screen uh, to Murthy and unmute him, because our first presentation from Schlivers Murthy, and he will talk to us about the development and testing of coupled global UFS experiments with an advanced atmospheric physics suite. You can go ahead, Marty. Can you see my screen? Uh, so far, we can see your desktop presentation. What can you see? I can see your desktop. Yes, I can see your desktop. There we go. Yes, now here comes the presentation. I guess I was yes, trying to put it on a bigger it. screen. You can't see that one, I guess. <laughs> okay, I will uh, present from my sm smaller screen. So my presentation is uh, on some experiments I have done with advanced physics suite in CCPP using uh, coupled UFS, global coupled UFS. I would like to acknowledge all the people listed here for their help and support during this development. The global core component coupled model that I used uses a F3 dynamical core based atmosphere, NOAA land model, GFDL MOM6 ocean model, and Los Alamos sea ice, size 5 sea ice model. And these four components are generally coupled either through NEMS mediator or through CMAPs using ESMF while the land model is embedded within the atmospheric physics package. So there is no explicit coupling for that. SST at the sea surface is obtained from the top level temperature of the MOM6 through NSST model. And the advanced suite, physics suite that is used in this experiment is uh, convection is based on scalable RAS, Rakao-Schubert, relaxed Rakao-Schubert, Microphysics is based on Morrison Gettleman version three, which is a double moment microphysics. And the boundary layer and shallow convection are treated by simplified higher order closure model of Bogan, Schutz, and Kruger. Relaxed Arco Schubert, some details are given here. It relaxes the conditionally unstable state towards uh, quasi equilibrium rather than requiring exact quasi equilibrium. And multiple cloud types with different props are included every, uh, in, invoked every physics time step. And each cloud modifies the environment by a fraction of its mass flux. Randomly, deep clouds are chosen randomly. The normalized mass flux can be a quadratic function of uh, cloud depth. And downdraft is based on Cheng and Arakawa 1997. A simple scale awareness is added by multiply by multiplying by one minus cloud fraction square, as in uh, Arakawa U. RAS version one was developed at NASA GSFC and version two at NSF EMC. And here are more details about RAS. I'm not going to go through all this list. People can read it. This Morrison Gettleman version three is published in this paper in 2019. And uh, a two-year NGGPS funding to EMC accelerated the implementation of uh, MG-type microphysics schemes into GFS. MG3 actually has five, compo five components and five number concentrations. So there are 10 prognostic variables associated with this. MG3 includes either hail or grapple as an option in addition to cloud droplets and uh, ice, rain, and snow. And uh, simplified higher order closure model is based on a assumed PDF approach, while the uh, traditional assumed PDF approaches require uh, many prognostic variables for uh, turbulence moments. Shock makes many simplifications, so only one prognostic variable is needed, which is the subgrid scale turbulent kinetic energy. 
This work is based on Bogenschutz and Kruger and uh, originally developed at University of Utah, imported to EMC via NOAA Climate Program Office Climate Process Team funding from 2014 to 2017. And PI was Professor Steven Kruger of University of Utah. And uh, the experimental configuration I've used is that MOM6 is at quarter degree tripolar grid. Size 5 is quarter degree tripolar grid. For the atmosphere, it's Fe3 non-hydrostatic dynamical core with no land model on the same grid. I have tested two resolutions, C384, 64 layers, and C768, 127 layers. For the C384, 64 layers, initial condition is from 2018, March 15th, and the run ran up to 2019, January 9th. So it's more than nine months. And I tried another experiment with this one used NEMS mediator. I tried another run with fractional grid and CMEPS mediator. Unfortunately, that run blew up after 2058 hours. I will not be showing any result from that run. And I also tried 768, 127 runs, one for 24 hours on HERA using NEMS mediator, another one a 10-day forecast using CMAPS mediator using 157 nodes on WCOS Dell. And here are some results from nine month run with C384, L64. I'll be showing only climatology. Here is the global mean evolution of uh, precipitation, evaporation, convective precipitation, and large-scale precipitation. The black lines here have two overlapping lines. One is precipitation, other one is evaporation. And uh, green line is convective precipitation, and yellow line is uh, large-scale precipitation. You can see that precipitation and evaporation are in pretty good balance, more or less. This is the more than nine-month run plotted here. And this plot shows Cloud frac global mean cloud fractions. The top line is total cloud fraction. The black line in the middle is uh, high cloud fraction, and yellow line is low cloud fraction, and green line is middle cloud fraction. And the total cloud is about uh, slightly less than 65%. This is an interesting plot here. The top panel is uh, precipitable water as a function of time. As you can see, it started off about 24.5 millimeters, went all the way up to 29 meters, millimeters, and then came down for December to about 24 millimeters. So it really got captured pretty good uh, seasonal cycle of water vapor. And the bottom panel is uh, area mean from 60 to 90 degrees. Black, black line, uh, this is the C CS concentration mean for 60 to 90. The black line is for the northern hemisphere and green line is for the southern hemisphere. As you can see, in the northern hemispheric winter, it had pretty good sea ice cover. And then in summer, it vanished and it's back again in the winter. Similarly, for the southern hemisphere, it became large in northern summer and then went down to zero in January. And here are July and December mean total precipitation. The top left panel is for a model and the right panel is from GPCP observation climatology. The top panel is for June, um, July and bottom panel is for December. As you can see, the patterns are captured quite well in the model or uh, summer monsoon is depicted well in the July case and then Precipitation has gone south, the south of the equator, and the pattern is very similar compared to the observation. Obviously, the magnitude is a little bit higher. Global mean for July is like 3.3 .3 compared to observation of 2.7, and in December it is 3.15 versus 2.68. And these these are similar plots for OLR. The top panel is for July, bottom is for December observation from SRB2 on the right panels for July and December. And as you can see, the model has gone through from Northern hemispheric low values to Southern hemisphere. 
and uh, African ITC, we also have more from north to south and everything looks very similar to observation. And uh, here is the high clouds, mean high clouds for July and December. Top, top left panel is for July and bottom left is for December. Similarly, the right side is July mean calypso cloud cover and for July and December at the bottom. Again, the, they are similar. I mean, the, the scale in this particular case is slightly different, unfortunately, but I think the model has behaved quite reasonably well. Similarly, for the low clouds, the plots are here. Here, there are some issues related to the right panels are again, Calypso observation and the left panel are from the model. The stratus are not that well defined. Are they three compared minutes? To me. Okay. Three minutes, you said? Yes. Thank you. And uh, here are zonal mean July and December winds. Right panels are observations, spark observations from or at all, which uh, gives an idea that model is doing roughly the same thing. And similar plots are for temperature also. I'm not going to deal with that much with there. And C768, 127 coupled runs, some results from that here. This is a 24 hour forecast from 768, 127 layer model. The le top left is precipitation, right is the high clouds, left, lower left is uh, low, middle clouds and lower light is, right is uh, low clouds. They seem to be behaving quite reasonable. And uh, some results from 10 day runs, I only show here global means. The top left panel is global mean precipitation evaporation and convective precipitation and large scale precipitation. Right side is the global mean cloud fractions. And precipitable water is increasing from about 20, 25 to 26.5, this is only 10 day forecast. And the lower right panel is global mean OLR, which seems to be equilibrating around 243 watts. And here is my last slide. So what's next? It appears that global coupled UFS can be used for weather to seasonal time scale, but the model needs to be tuned for the deterministic short range weather to probabilistic long range seasonal prediction by taking advantage of scale awareness. TFS V2 was implemented in FY 2011. We need its replacement as soon as possible. It's already nine years now. 2024, it will be like 13 years. Efficiency of the model needs to be improved to make coupled model fit the operational window. Right now, my runs are not that efficient. And multiple experimentations are needed for tuning the physics to get the best possible results before the official parallel testing. Coupled initial conditions are needed, so coupled DA is needed. And stability of the ATM dynamical core needs to be made more robust. For example, in my nine month run, model actually blew up after seven months. Then I had to reduce the time step for the dynamical core. And uh, of course, one of the big bottleneck would be the insufficient computer resources. That's all for my presentation. I will take any questions. Thank you, Marthy. Um, Tracy, I think we have a couple minutes questions. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, there's a couple of questions on the Slack. Oh, am I looking? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I'm looking under the wrong section. I'll read the first question from Lisa. Uh, she said, have you compared the results with the current GFS V15 physics in this coupled setup? For example, does the change in physics parameterizations help you with any biases in the mean states? Uh, no, I have not done it myself because everybody else is working on the current operational physics. Plus, uh, I think this is the first nine month run ever done at EMC on this model. So there was no second nine month run ever done. 
The second Thank question. You, Marcy. We have the second question is from Philip Pagan. There is a lack of convection along the equator in the Western Pacific, which results in the equatorial cold tongue to extend too far west when coupled. Do you have any ideas on how to remedy this? Well, uh, right now I don't know, but uh, as I said, we need to do more experiments to understand how the coupled model behaves. Yes, that is one of the biggest question of whether the coupled model can behave right. In the past, when we have done coupled modeling, when we coupled, models started getting colder and colder because of coupling with the ocean. So it's not a trivial task. We need to do a lot more experimentation. This is the first to try at how it behaves in a longer integration. Thank you, Marthi. Uh, we're gonna have to move. Okay. We're gonna have to move on uh, to the next speaker. Um, so our next presentation is from David Randall, and he will talk to us about testing the UFS with alternative cloud parameterizations. So I think we're transferring the, the screen control to Randall. Yep. It should be good. Dave, you should be okay. able to speak now. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, and there are my slides. So um, let me start by saying, well, first of all, the, the title is Testing the UFS with Alternative Cloud Parameterizations. And uh, my co-authors are Steve Kruger, who is in the meeting right now, I believe, and Don Daszlik, who you see here with his Stetson. And we acknowledge support from two uh, NOAA grants down below. Uh, Dave, so, we don't see uh, our presentation yet. You don't? Okay, where's the share screen button? You should have pre be have a ability to present. Okay, hang on. I'm sorry. Tracy, do you have Dave's presentation load in case we need to present for him? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Do I need to do that? Um, sure. David, do you see a tab on the left-hand side of the control panel that shows a, a video icon? Yeah, I just clicked show. Oh, video icon, camera. Okay, so that's the and webcam. That's his camera. Yeah. There's this a sharing. One. There should there's be a, a sharing of a, item yeah. in your go-to webinar. There's a tab that says sharing. Control on top. Share my screen. There we go. Yes, great. You got it? Okay, sorry. I'm a it's Zoomer. <laughs> uh, we don't see a presentation yet. Now we do. So if now you want you to do. put it in. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I've lost uh, three minutes or so here. Sorry. Testing the UFS with alternative cloud parameterizations. My co authors are Steve Kruger, who is in the meeting right now, and Don Deslick. And we acknowledge a couple of uh, NOAA grants. For support. Um, I will be showing some model results here from uh, UFS, but the main purpose of this talk is uh, to uh, basically tell you uh, our experiences moving from GFS to UFS over a period of years. So I'm going to show some results from uh, Chikira Sujiyama parameterization modified uh, to include the scale awareness developed by Arakawa and Wu. Uh, this was mentioned already a, a few minutes ago by uh, Worthy. Um, 
Shakira Sujiyama, which I'm going to call CS, has uh, multiple updraft types, uh, 17 in fact. So it's a spectral uh, parameterization of cumulus combustion. It has a state-dependent entrainment rate, which is quite important. And it has a prognostic closure, which is also quite important. It was first tested in the Japanese model MIROC. We modified it for use in the uh, scalarware framework of Arakawa and Wu, and we call the result Seesaw. Um, so we first implemented Seesaw in the GFS with help from Worthy and others. And uh, this was in the context of the climate process team that Steve Kruger led, which was already mentioned by Worthy. Um, and uh, later, as I'll show you, we implemented Seesaw in the UFS using CCPP. So I'm going to show some low resolution results here from the UFS C96, so roughly 100 kilometer grid spacing and uh, 64 levels. And we're looking at Hurricane Harvey case. So I'm going to show results from 120 hours, five days, and um, 240 hours, 10 days. So here's the five day uh, forecast. On the left, you have uh, results from a low resolution version of the, uh, with the standard physics. In the middle, you have the seesaw results. And on the right, you have a version of the observations from GPM. And you can see that seesaw has produced a considerably stronger precipitation at this stage of the game relative to uh, the controlled version of the model um, at this resolution. These are the corresponding results at uh, 10 days out. And uh, the, um, the system has not moved appropriately in either model. You can see what's happened in the observations. But uh, uh, again, there's stronger precipitation uh, with uh, Seesaw. Um, and uh, looking at the results, one of the interesting things is that the uh, Seesaw seems to spin up faster. That's the red curve here. Seems to spin up faster for uh, precipitation uh, than, uh, than the standard physics package. Uh, the Harvey results are shown here on the left side. And on the right, I have some results from the Dorian case, which I won't show otherwise, except in these line plots. Uh, the outgoing long wave radiation initially is uh, slightly lower with Seesaw relative to the standard model. But after some time, it becomes larger. And the reason for that is that the precipitable water content of the atmosphere is decreasing with seesaw relative to the standard model. Um, I can see the same thing has happened in the Dorian forecast over here. We have also been working with uh, a type of superparameterization that we call multi-instance. I will explain this briefly. Uh, we first implemented the superparameterization in the uh, spectral GFS, so uh, seems like a long time ago. And then we went from that to the FB3 version of GFS, and we're now in the process of installing it in the UFS using CCPP. I'll say a little more about that here in a minute. So the basic idea, as uh, probably most of you know, is that uh, in a conventional model, as shown on the top here, uh, you have parameterizations of, of various things, including convection listed in red. And uh, what you do with the super parameterization is you, you put a cloud resolving model in every column of the GCM. And that CRM uh, simulates the convection directly. So what remains to be parameterized is microphysics, radiation, and turbulence. And those parameterizations are implemented on the fine grid of the CRM. So it's really pretty different. And in men, uh, experience uh, largely with CAM has shown that this uh, superparameterization gives uh, much better results for many kinds of things. But of course, it's also a lot more expensive than a conventional parameterization. What we've done with uh, GFS is uh, implement a multi-instance superparameterization in which we actually have more than one, this picture shows two, but in fact, uh, up to 10 CRMs running essentially in parallel in every grid column. So this is really expensive. And the 
average of the heating and drying from these multiple CRMs is fed back to the GCM. So each CRM sees exactly the same large scale weather as simulated by the GCM. So the same weather going here, the same weather going here. They produce slightly different heating and drying because the cloud resolving models are initialized differently, small perturbations in the initial conditions. And then the ensemble average is fed back. And this is interesting from the point of view of uh, the uh, uh, ensemble spread and how it is affected by uh, uh, basically uncertainty on the on the cloud scale. So I'm going to show in this slide some results from uh, several things. First of all, there's this is a control version of the CFS again, uh, essentially 100 kilometer grid spacing. Um, this is um, one cloud resolving model with only eight grid columns per uh, per GCM grid column. So it's a very low resolution. Uh, if I compare these two, you can you can identify the same weather systems. Obviously, they look a bit different, but the basic uh, structure is the same. This is what you get going still with one CRM up to 32 columns. So now we have uh, a lot more degrees of freedom in the cloud resolving model, and uh, uh, but the same grid spacing, I should say, same grid spacing for the uh, eight uh, eight columns here and 32 columns here. And then this is the case where we allow uh, three CRMs running in parallel, each with 32 columns to feed back uh, on the GCM. And this is just a very short forecast, uh, a little bit less than a day. But you can see, again, the uh, uh, to a large extent, the uh, convective features visible in these precipitation maps are similar, although you can see pretty big differences, for example, here, over over South America, and a general tendency for the uh, CRM to produce locally stronger precipitation. So, um, as I said, the, the main uh, message I want to convey in this uh, short talk is uh, uh, the experience that we've had going from uh, uh, the old uh, spectral GFS to to the UFS and uh, we have now run the UFS with uh, Seesaw, uh, which I showed you, on both Hera and Cheyenne. Cheyenne is NCAR's supercomputer. So the Harvey results I showed you a minute ago were uh, done on Hera, and the Dorian results, which I showed you just a little bit of, were done on Cheyenne. On both machines, the setup was very easy and straightforward, and uh, it was as good as uh, anybody could wish for, I think. And so we congratulate all the people who've worked very hard to make this possible over the last several years. Um, Excuse me, Dave, uh, three-minute warning. Yes, thank you. Three-minute warning. Problem. Yes. Um, our experience with uh, SEAM is that it's uh, orders of magnitude easier to work with than the old uh, scripts that were used with uh, GFS. Um, we have implemented Seesaw in the UFS now via the common community physics package, and uh, we are in the process of implementing SP there, uh, basically writing metadata at the moment. Um, and it's been a very good experience so far. We are working to be able to use the UFS to do runs with these two uh, new cloud parameterizations, as well as the control version of the model, using both climatological SSTs, that is annually repeating SSTs and CIs, and also AMIP style runs. And we know that these things are coming with the S2S release, but we're trying to do it sooner. And we've had help from Grant Furrell, uh, Dom Heinzeller, and uh, Leisha Byrne, that our chair, and uh, we are making progress. So we thank you again for, for your assistance. So the bottom line here is that uh, we've experienced very directly uh, a tremendous progress uh, with the model over the last several years. We've come out of the dark jungle of spectral GFS and into the bright sunlight of UFS. That's it. Uh, that's a good praise for the UFS. Uh, nice to hear that. Uh, Tracy, do we have any questions? This time there are no questions yet. Okay. 
Waiting a little bit, just uh, anybody wants to enter a question on the Slack? All right, if not, uh, thank you, Dave. So we're going to move you. on to the next presentation. And that is going to be from Joseph Olson. And he will talk to us about developing the MYNN EDMF to improve boundary layer cloud structures. So Joe, uh, Tracy will be passing you the presenter ability and unmuting you shortly uh, here. I passed the presenter and I sent a request to unmute. There we go. Okay, I'm unmuted. We can now. hear you. Now to figure out sharing. Hold on a second. In your GoToMeeting control panel, there is a sharing on the very top, a sharing menu. Uh-huh, got it. Show. Feel like I'm on the wrong track. From our end, uh, we're still waiting to to see your screen, um, Joe. So there's something you need to do to show screen, and it should be on the screen menu. Cancel it. Main screen. There you go. Oh, it's work. It's working now. We can see your screen. You're seeing the Slack for now. Excellent. Let me pull this over. You see that? Yes. Okay. So you okay. start as soon as you're ready. Apologize for the clumsiness. Okay, so I'll be talking about how we're improving boundary layer clouds and the MYNN EDMF. I uh, thank my co-authors here who've uh, all contributed in various forms. I'm just going to outline some of the main features of the MYNN first and then go right into some of our testing in single column as well as 3D mode and then uh, summarize some of our lingering issues later on. So right now we have the MYNN EDMF in four different uh, models, two of them via CCPP. It's been in the RAP and HER operational system since 2014. It's an EDMF scheme, um, has both local and non-local transport capabilities. It also can be classified as a moist turbulent mixing scheme, it mixes these uh, moist turbulent, uh, these uh, conserved thermodynamic variables. And we use uh, cloud PDFs to estimate the subgrid set subgrid scale cloud fractions and mixing ratios, which uh, both impact the turbulent mixing and this information is coupled to the radiation scheme for consistency. So the original version of the MYNN was, oops, sorry, it was tuned to uh, LES and that was kind of ahead of its time. That um, was done by Nakanishi and Nino. Um, since we've taken it, we've added this mass flux component and using it in the RAP and HER, we've used uh, basically developing it to uh, provide uh, improved forecasts for a wide variety of variables here. And now that we've moved into the global testing framework for course, it amplifies the work to a lot of different uh, new climate regimes that are still work in progress. Uh, we still do a lot of single column model testing now on the uh, GMTB SCM. And with further tuning to LES, I'll be talking more about that uh, later on. So some key components here, the mass flux scheme is that it's a spectral plume model, uh, which means it's trying to represent plumes of various sizes from 100 meters in width up to 1,000 meters in width. So it has all these 10 plumes, but not all of them are active at a given time. It's a function of the boundary layer height, cloud ceiling, and the grid spacing. 
this, the sole thing that distinguishes these plumes from each other is these uh, the lateral entrainment rates, which is inversely proportional to the vertical velocity and the width of the plumes. So you have much larger entrainment rates for these smaller plumes. So they tend to not uh, penetrate as high, only doing dry non-local mixing, whereas the larger plumes can penetrate the lifting condensation level depicted by that uh, pink plane and produce uh, all the clouds. Of course, that depends on the background RH and whatnot too. But um, um, so these plumes are only active when they are super adiabatic in the lowest 50 meters of the atmosphere and positive surface heat flux. So the subgrid scale uh, uh, cloud fractions are taken from uh, Chabrol and Bechtel. It's their very simple forms, all as simple as you can find in the literature. The, like both of them are functions of the standard uh, deviation of the saturation deficit, deficit, which is the sigma s. And the stratus component, uh, it's a function of basically the resolve scale uh, variables of heat and uh, mixing ratio. The mass flux components is the function of the mass flux itself. They're combined together and ultimately piped into this cloud fraction formulation. So you get is a variation of uh, cloud fractions and unsaturated uh, grid spaces as well as uh, saturated grid spacing. But as you can see from this alone, if you just take this off the box, you'll never be able to get cloud ceilings, which by definitions are cloud fractions greater than uh, point or 50%. Uh, so this needs to be modified if you're gonna get a cloud fraction in the unsaturated grid. So that's one of the changes we made where we multiply this by a factor, an RH dependent factor to amplify the cloud fractions in nearly saturated conditions. And as I'll show you later on, this really helps out with the ceiling forecast. So this is an example of how uh, the scheme varies in behavior at the time of function of the day. So uh, just looking at the number of plumes active in a given grid column uh, during this uh, diurnal cycle. As you can see, when a, in the morning, when a, the sun pops up and starts heating the surface, you start tapping into the smaller plumes first, and then ultimately midday, it's you're tapping into all 10 plumes here in this Herlex simulation. Uh, so for a simulation taken from just about, about a month ago, actually. Um, so it's using top of the trunk code, actually. So um, you can see only in places where there's precipitating systems, where it's, you're shielding this, um, the surface from this solar radiation, not getting enough uh, uh, of a super adiabatic layer to drive the mass flux scheme. Otherwise, in most places, it's pretty it's active pretty much everywhere. On the right is uh, the same uh, loop over the same time, but now I'm showing the maximum mass flux in a grid column. And for presentation purposes only here, I'm coloring the mass flux as negative for grid columns that don't produce uh, any saturated plumes. Uh, whereas if at least one plume saturates in the grid, grid cell, I will keep it uh, denoted as positive and give it a warm color. So this gives you an example of the aerial coverage uh, produced by this uh, EDMF scheme. And for this exact same case on the uh, 24th of, of June at 21 ETC, comparing the visible satellite imagery against three different uh, configurations of a Herlex system uh, for this case, all valid at the same time. Um, I wanna look, just bring your attention to a few um, cloud formations here. Basically, the extent of this, the shallow cumulus so here in the upper Midwest, come from the top of Minnesota all the way down to Missouri. And you get this bridge of shallow Q between uh, Colorado and say Illinois and the extension of the shallow queue into central Texas here. Well, this configuration of the herd right now do, does not allow any of our subgrid clouds from the stratus component or the mass flux to interact with the radiation. So all these clouds you're seeing here are simply uh, saturated grid cells. So these are clouds produced by the Thompson microphysics scheme. And as you can expect, it's gonna miss all of these uh, shallow Q basically because they're produced by non-local uh, fluxes of moisture, of course, and that's not the, the responsibility of the Thompson microphysics scheme alone to get. If you turn on the stratus component alone, you start getting some filling in because there's a high RH in this upper Midwest and especially over the marine areas. 
but you're still missing all of that shallow queue. It's only when you really add the mass flux and you start getting those clouds up in Minnesota all the way down to maybe get that bridge across uh, Colorado and Illinois and some of the extension. So it does wonders that really help in that, getting that aerial coverage of the, of the shallow queue right. It's more easy to quantify this in single column model mode, of course. And so here I'm showing you five sample cases of varying um, uh, shallow cumulus days taken from the lasso 2016 case. On the left column, I'm showing you a little time series of a cloud base and cloud tops comparing the single column model when M1 EDMF against the LES. So for most of these, you can see overall, it gets the, the variations in the, the depth of the clouds, whether they're really thin cases or deeper clouds pretty well. The onset tends to maybe be a little bit early biased in the single column model. Liquid water path on the second panel, uh, you just compare the orange to the yellow, first of all here, uh, and it shows that it, it matches it uh, fairly nicely for all these cases, ultimately. And then uh, the cloud cover in the far right, uh, it generally matches it pretty well too, except for at the end during these high RH regimes where it starts activating the stratus component. Uh, in that case, luckily that the stratus component is not predicting a large mixing ratio to go with it, so it doesn't have a big impact on the on the liquid water pass. But overall, it, it, it seems the mass flux component is definitely doing a very good job in these cases. And as the complete independent case, there's been no tuning for any of these cases in, uh, taken from the 2018. These are all 15 pure shallow cumulus cases, meaning there's no other cloud layers going on in any of these cases. And here we're just averaging out uh, the times between noon and three in the afternoon um, to, and comparing the cloud structures in the single column model against the LES. And you can see we're getting the cloud depth really well and pretty much the total amount of mixing ratio as well. One other question we have is uh, what happens when you run with a standalone shallow Q scheme? Joe, uh, a three minute warning. Okay. Um, if you run with a standalone shallow Q scheme like, like we do in the global framework, what, what is the overall impact? So here I'm plotting all of our liquid water pass from the single column model against the LES, and you can see that the um, they're pretty much good in good agreement. If you just plot the shallow Q uh, runs with the shallow Q scheme against the ones without, you can see overall there's not much difference. There's only three cases where the shallow Q scheme is even making an impact at all, suggesting it's not very active. So from this alone, I could say that it's not necessarily degrading anything, but it's not really adding much. So despite these nice liquid water paths and uh, cloud depths and onset, stuff like that, we're still overall have a high bias and downward shortwave radiation, both the RAP and the HER. Um, although there have been significant improvements in comparing the current operational version, which is in dash lines, compared to the, the next generation one, which will be implemented uh, later this year. Uh, for all seasons, there's, there's significant improvements, especially in the cooler months, where we're almost always below 30 watts per meter squared. Um, bias, but in the summer we still have a high bias. So the last metric we want to use to make sure we're, we have good solid clouds coming out of the model is the, for ceilings. So for a long time we've had the ceiling diagnostic uh, that's that's been a standard. The FA likes it. It has a lot of skill, but we're going to test just using the MYNN cloud fraction and see if uh, you search up from the surface and find a, a a level, model level where the cloud fraction exceeds 50%, you can say there's a ceiling there. Overall, um, from the looking at the thousand foot ceiling die offs, so you can see from the cooler months from January to April, the high Q skill score is actually improved just by using this MYNN clouds alone um, and it has a much lower bias as well, um, but still a slightly high biased. But during the summer months, you can see that then it becomes more of a draw for a high skill score, even a slight degradation. And the bias becomes a little bit low. So I think we still have work to do because this is especially, a, a, the users want, would prefer a high bias if there is a bias at all. And I could add also for 50, uh, sorry, for 500 foot ceilings, it's even a slightly lower bias. So there's still work to do on this overall. But um, I'd say that, 
you know, for cloud forecasts and interaction with radiation, MYNN has become a fairly mature scheme. Um, there's lingering issues with the high downward shortwave radiation bias. I think we really need to hit the cloud overlap and effective radii next, because I think overall our cloud macro physics are doing pretty good. We still are a little bit low on ceilings in the warm season, so that's more work to do. Um, I better just stop and take questions in. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Tracy, are there any questions? Yeah, you have a couple questions. The first question is from Grant Furl. Have you experienced much with different formulations for entrainment for the different plumes in MYNN? For example, some folks have experimented with stochastic entrainment events whose probability is controlled by some characteristic length, which could be very, which could vary by your plume size. So uh, the, the short answer is yes, we have varied this a little bit. Uh, actually, the original version of the scheme did have um, that stochastic entrainment event type feature with it, but the the stochastic portion of that code was so slow, it was not, you're not able to run it in operational mode, so we had to take it off. Um, I'd love to get it back in there because it had some good properties. Um, um, however, since then, we've tried a few other formulations and, you know, of course, you you know, ultimately entrainment is probably the most important thing that's going to dictate the evolution of your plumes outside of the environment itself. But uh, but basically, um, we haven't varied our formulations that much outside of just uh, plume width dependent or vertical velocity dependent. I haven't tried any like RH dependent uh, methods or anything like that. Uh, Joe, we are at time, so we're going to move on to the next presentation. But I see you have more questions on the Slack, so. Hopefully, you can uh, interact with those uh, those people asking questions through Slack. Right. Our Thanks. last presentation of the day is by Valerie Uding, and he's going to talk to us about the unified gravity wave physics in the vertically extended atmosphere models of NGGPS and UFS. So, Valerie. Um, Tracy will be making a presenter, and we can already see your screen. All right, great. And we can hear you, so please go ahead. Yes. Can you see now? Yeah. Yes. Hi, it's, it's not in presenting mode. Oh. No. Now we, no. we want to uh, see your pattern. There. there we go. Okay, thank you. So, Sorry, uh, Valerie, we are seeing your presenter mode screen. Uh, so we want to see your other screen with the with the presentation. Now we are seeing that split screen with the presenter notes. So that's because you have two okay. screens. Okay. okay, just just let me close this one and try one more. How about now? It's coming. No, it is still the wrong screen. So on the on the sharing um, on the sharing tab of your GoToWebinar, there should be a drop down menu called Screens, and it should allow you to choose your screen too. So. Uh, not on the website where you are, not on the browser, but on the GoToWebinar control panel that's part of the app. My screen and afterwards, just the window, main screen. I have main screen. Um, I, I don't I don't think I'm seeing the same thing you're seeing. So. There should be a go to webinar control panel with a um, sharing tab, and in there there is a screen command, and you can choose screen two. Hey Valerie, in the screen that you're on right now on your desktop, can you move your mouse all the way down to the lower left hand corner and click on that? Not not that one, the one to the right. You almost had it. You were down there. 
Yes. On the Let's lower go. left, the third icon. Okay, Valerie, I think the best thing we can do is to present the way you were presenting. Just close, Just close that left tab, that Just left. Uh... Okay. Just do it from. Uh, the, just make a control yeah. and put PDF yeah. because I, I I don't I don't understand what's going on. I'm sorry. That's all I right. have to control Hi. panel. I have question chat. I have audio. I have stuff. I have show options. Firefox, Microsoft, or UFS. Okay, I think you can just click on that X where your uh, mouse is right now and make your screen as, as you know, bigger and we'll just go with that. That there's a, sorry, there's an X uh, to close that left side, um, you know, where all the little slides are showing, just X that no, so no, that goes what away. What you can see now, what you can see now? Can uh, we see? can see your PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. Um, can, I, can I start presentation? Yeah, well, we cannot see. Um, can you zoom it a little bit less where it has, says 139 on the bottom, make it a smaller number like 100 so we can, the slide fits on the screen. You see 139 on the bottom right. Can you make that a, a smaller number by dragging the button on the bar? Yes, I try. Yes. Yeah, great. How about now? Now we can see your, your entire slide. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry for, for my basic area. <laughs> <laughs> Handling with control panel. Okay, so right. thank you, thank you uh, for for your questions, guys. So today I would like to talk about what we did last year: to unify gravity wave physics and the vertically extended atmosphere model of uh, NGPPS and UFS. I mostly will concentrate on the representation of new version uh, UGVP version one in a free GFS eighty kilometers and show also its influence on. JSM one. So, uh, what we put uh, new features in the version one of this unified gravity wave physics? First of all, we make some steps to physics based forcing and relax the static specification of the uh, gravity wave momentum fluxes uh, using uh, mirror to static function, uh, which use in mirror two. So we try to put convective triggers and also uh, uh, study to, to, to learn how to put extratropical uh, excitation of uh, gravity waves due to uh, frontogenesis function and Akubawa's uh, triggers, which is uh, doing balance of the uh, results case school. We also update the braking scheme. Uh, do revision of a free gfs uh, 127 light, uh, damping uh, decor which is we go back to the normal two layer second order diffusion with more accent on the gravity waves in the upper layers including mix and heat and drag also add options for control gravity wave cooling heating by 80 prandle number and put some other extended set of knobs and diagnostics, which uh, for UFS will be quite users will be quite useful to, to play with these schemes and get different results in the upper layers. So, and of course, we start to do with multi year free GFS low resolution now C96 with climate configuration. We made uh, 10 year runs with this configuration to see how this model with uh, gravity wave physics can reproduce. Semenial uh, classic annual oscillation and also polar vortex dynamics. So on the right plant line, you have uh, basically equatorial wind oscillation reduced in 2015-2018 uh, 
model initialized from January 2018 versus without gravity wave versus all GFS 15 parameterization of convective gravity waves. So you don't see any anything like quasi biennial oscillation except some semi semi oscillation above 60 kilometers. If you put the uh, recent version UBP1 uh, with gravity waves excited at six kilometers, so you can see something like quasi biennial oscillation. And if you compare when with MERA2 for this period, you can see that we started to produce two year oscillation between 20 and 40 kilometers and semi oscillation above. Uh, we also did some experiments uh, with uh, gravity wave to, to, to diagnose uh, resolve gravity wave activity at C768 uh, resolution is roughly 13 kilometers. And on the uh, left panel of this slide, you can see diagnostics of resolve gravity wave resolved by dynamical core for January in July, and we can compare with in terms of a temperature root mean square at uh, 10 gigapascal, roughly 35 kilometers. And you can see that it's nicely match the empirical model of uh, uh, German uh, colleagues, uh, Manfred Aaron et al., recently published in basically if the analytic gravity by has passed. So this is basically summary slide that we started to do with this climate uh, resolution, we changed the static uh, specification of the non-stationary gravity waves to the seasonally dependent, and we put additional forcing in the equatorial region. In uh, low resolution run, we just put some annual oscillation near equator to generate QBO. In the short-term run with C768, we also try to modulate uh, the equatorial uh, forcing gravity waves by deep convective precipitation traces, suggested by Murphy. And you can see also this run from this uh, FFE 768 for August 2018. This is uh, uh, one month of a run and diagnostics of resolved gravity waves. And you can see that. Resolve gravity waves uh, diagnosed from DICO can reproduce all three sources of waves, deep convection or waves in France. And we... uh, Valerie, Valerie, excuse me. Your slides are not advancing. So slide... you need to, to scroll down. Which slide are you in right now? You see where is this slide? No? I'm seeing your title slide. I'm sorry. I, 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 Ligia, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I see my presentation, but for some reason, I, I, I don't know. You have only title slide. We are seeing your title slide. How slide one. Now? now, you don't see. We are this seeing is... just the title slide. I'm sorry. So, um, I, 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 I don't know what what we can do because it works for me <laughs> i was on only on the slide number six uh, i'm sorry i should have uh, brought it up to your attention uh, before i'm sorry if i i, I don't know what we what we can do i i'm, I'm sorry it's just bizarre, bizarre settings for me uh, okay now we see slide two no, you can see, but you can see in, 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 in the presentation mode, as far as I understand. Yeah, can you just, uh, on the left side of your screen, you see those little, small yes, slides? Yes, I'm, can I'm you go to, to my six? slides. Yeah. Lisa, I'm oh, trying to put my slides. Can you see? <laughs> can you click on slide six on that left panel? Yes, now we can see slide six. So just keep clicking like seven, eight, etc. as you go along. The issue is it's not working in presentation mode. And so I think you have yeah. to just keep it out of presentation mode. Yeah, just keep it as is and advance to click on seven once you get to seven.
So let me try to away from presentation mode. I increase with slide capacity. Okay. Something like yes. this. What else is only I can I can do it. So I quickly, I quickly, because you see only the, the title slides, so I just start from the second. So this is basically, you can read uh, what we put in the, uh, the new version of uh, Unified Gravity Wave Physics version one. And you can see the panel which is produced with a four year equatorial oscillation in zonal wind. If you don't use uh, Unified Gravity Wave Physics, so in the top panel, you can see just annual variation of the zonal winds above. This is what we can see with unified gravity wave physics uh, version one, equatorial oscillation, and it's quite uh, comfortably comparable with MERA two. So on this slide, you can see resolved gravity wave activity diagnosed from the uh, C768 uh, on the top uh, left panel, which is uh, January and July of the JFS. 768 and 10 gigapascal uh, in terms of a temperature RMS. Uh, and below you can see what we can compare with satellite diagnostics of gravity wave from cyber instrument from your own at all. Uh, here you can see the summary of what we can do uh, with new uh, forcing of gravity waves uh, in terms of momentum flux, uh, which is now running from a reasonable in the wave number. Uh, up to 10 millipascal, and we put seasonality of this gravity reflux according again empirical model R and at all 2017. We also put 3 d uh, perturbation of these fluxes by precipitation from the 3 GFS. And now we can basically move uh, to experiments with the uh, FFGFS 768, but before um, uh, putting some results, I can tell you that comparing to the preparational version of C768, we use so called reduce uh, dynamical core dissipation. So you can compare what we use only two layers second order diffusion, comparing to 20 layers of second order diffusion and relay friction of the uh, specification is coming from the uh, much less comparing to the operational setup. So we can run this model uh, in terms of the uh, influence of this uh, true formulation of the core dissipation. You can see basically at one millibar level uh, kinetic energy spectra, you can dramatic uh, changes of the kinetic energy spectra red line attenuation due to the second order diffusion and 20, 20 top layers of a free GFS. So uh, the, regular, the reduced level uh, actually produce what we can see and much better resolve mesoscales waves above uh, wave number 100. Uh, some results of the 16 day forecast from initialized from MERA 2 for July 2018. Uh, on the top layer, you can see zonal mean distribution of temperature and wind for September 1st, 2018. This is pre current preparational version of JFS version 16. This is JFS 16 with reduced uh, uh, dynamical core dissipation and uh, uh, new gravity wave physics. And as a control, you have MERA 2 uh, simulation of the same variables. And you can see from comparison by eye that uh, the version with uh, reduced dissipation can produce much better agreement after 60 days with MERA 2, while preparational version free running without data simulation basically damp uh, uh, zonal winds and uh, heat temperature in the above 40 kilometers. Valerie, this is a three minute warning. Yes, okay. So this is basically uh, to show you some, uh, some, some equatorial oscillation which we try to do with uh, compa in comparison with MERA 2. So different forcing specification are near the top. So you can see uh, we, we, can, we, we, we can match with uh, basically equatorial oscillation uh, in the 
for in the 10 year uh, run with GFS, 9, uh, GFS uh, C96, 100 kilometer resolution. And also we can reproduce nicely in the top uh, the Kubo, uh, as Kubo, Kubo, Kubo relationship with C semenial oscillation, having much more semenial oscillation during the Kubo West fields, which is, uh, which is agreed with Mira to and Europe analysis. We got also Kubo now in this ozone oscillation, westerly, easterly, westerly for consecutive years. And the most important results for medium range and stress prediction. So if you uh, with unified gravity wave physics and reduce the quantity, uh, we can reproduce climate teleconnection. For instance, during the western phase Kubo, you have a strong jet weak planetary waves activity, very cold and broad uh, uh, polar vortex, which is uh, we can match in this case, uh, FLPGFS prediction with uh, meritory analysis. During the easterly phase, Kubo, you have much more active planetary waves, weak polar vortex, and of course, much less spread of cold area ar around the Arctic. And, uh, to, 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 to highlight the importance of this uh, gravity wave physics to the uh, space web applications, so I just would like to show you the seasonality of the zonal winds with and without gravity waves uh, at 45 south and snapshot of the uh, zonal winds with current, with, uh, with current WAM GCM without gravity wave physics and with gravity wave physics and compare with mirror to in your upper analysis you can see that uh, gravity wave physics is very important to predict the uh, middle, middle uh, mesosphere and lower atmosphere winds, which is quite important for realistic dynamics and transport of major species in the uh, ITM prediction, ionosphere atmosphere model prediction. And to conclude, so uh, this version of, UF, of unified gravity wave physics established a pathway to improve the FFGFS climate above the tropopause. We basically start to reproduce observed annual and terrenal variation of temperature in the ozone. It's provide promise to improve uh, medium range and a seasonal to seasonal prediction comparing to the stratospheric dynamics of lava for GFS version 15. So this version of uh, gravity wave physics uh, in the climate configuration, we produce dike work and reproduce realistic uh, quasi biennial and semi-annual oscillation of the equatorial dynamics, along with seasonality of extratropical dynamics. In the Arctic stratosphere, we have link between Kubo phase planetary wave dynamics and polar water strength, seen from the data and reanalysis. And now, for the first time, we simulated this phenomena which can have a lot of potential to improve S2S and air prediction of the stratospheric dynamics. And for the space wave application with GSM1, we will require updates and tune up gravity of physics from 30 to 130 kilometers to properly predict propagation of waves, planetary waves, tides, and anti mixing from below. Thank you and sorry for my basic mess up with. Thank you, Valerie. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time, so we're not going to have the ability to entertain questions, uh, but there are questions for you on Slack, so please uh, follow up uh, with those. And all this right. uh, brings us to the end of our session, so I'd like to thank all the speakers and also all the, all the audience for uh, living through the day with this um, online type of workshop. And uh, we are going to reconvene tomorrow at 11 Eastern uh, back in the go-to webinar uh, for another plenary session on the same theme of model dynamics, physics, and air quality. Uh, before we close for the day, is there any announcement from the other organizers? Okay, if not, uh, thank you, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow at 11 Eastern. Thank you, Leisha. Thank you, Leisha.